All right, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a three o'clock block here on a given Wednesday. And we're talking energy in America, and we're defining our terms a little bit broadly today. Energy includes everything that affects energy as well as energy. And America affects the entire hemisphere. <laughs> That's why we're talking to Emily Medina in Mexico City. Is that where you are, Emily? Yes, I'm in Mexico City right now. Okay, she's with the Energy Policy Research Organization, the Lou Puderisi shop in Washington, but uh, she is there, may I say, man on the, man on the, uh, on the job uh, in Mexico, Mexico City, and she reports to us how things are doing there. We want to hear everything about what's going on. So, Emily, first, uh, let's, let's uh, get a report from you on COVID in Mexico. I know you have some charts. Why don't you describe the, the trend lines? Sure. First of all, thanks for the invitation. It's, I'm glad to be here today. Glad and, to have you. Yeah, I prepared some slides to show, you know, how the COVID-19 is, is going on in Mexico, you know. Um, and recently, you know, the number of, of the, the death toll has really increased, you know, dramatically over the last couple of months. Um, Right now, we are the third country with the most, you know, in death because of COVID-19. So it's getting very serious in the country. And I'm going to provide a little bit of overview of what actions the government has been taking to deal with this issue and what the response has been on the government side. Yeah. To put it in perspective, the first... Uh, the number one country in the world is the United States. We have, we have achieved uh, a certain kind of excellence in the number of people who have caught the disease and died, thanks to our president. Um, and, and for us, it's 170,000 already, something like that. I have people died, uh, and we have 5.5 million people who have caught the disease. These are stunning numbers. The second one is Brazil. Um, Brazil, um, uh, they're not too concerned about COVID and COVID is coming for them. Um, and that's really tragic. And the third is Mexico. We have, you have something in the order of 55,000 deaths already. That's one third of the US, but that, that is a very large number for you. Um, and so I, I want to examine, um, well, I want to examine all the demographics. On yes. Okay. And the, the death toll right now is close to 60,000. Mm -hmm. You know, the number is very high. And, you know, if we take into account um, the number of tests that we are having in the country do not match, you know, with the increasing death toll that we're seeing in the country. And in the next chart, um, if you could, yeah. Here we can see in more detail, you know, how Mexico compares to other countries worldwide in terms of the, you know, the tests that are being performed. And as we can see, you know, Mexico is, you know, and the country with the least number of tests um, compared to, you know, all of this and on the right that we're seeing, you know. Yeah, so, but uh, Emily, doesn't it, if you have fewer tests, then you're less accurate. In other words, if you have more tests, you find more cases, right? That's correct. So, you know, in terms of the number of cases that have been reported by the government, we have the, the number of 57,000, you know, people. But if we, you know, take into account um, that the, the government's really not um, carrying out uh, as many tests as it should, to match, you know, with the number of population and different aspects of, you know, the Mexican demographics. It's, you know, that's one of the key issues that we're having in Mexico right now in terms of the dealing and the response of the COVID-19. Mm. So here on the next slide, we can see that the number of, of tests that have been, you know, um, applied since uh, March 6th. So as we can see, you know, the, the tests, you know, increased um, throughout time and, and they reached their peak on July 23rd. And it's the odd thing here and what tells you a lot in terms of the data 
and the COVID situation is that as the number of cases rose and the test started to decline. So, you know, it, it shouldn't be the case. Uh, you know, what we should be seeing is that as the number of cases is increasing, we should see more tests being performed throughout the country, not the opposite. How, how do you explain the decline? The decline in tests? Yeah. Well, basically, I mean, I guess um, once the numbers um, start to be unfavorable for, you know, the government, then you see the reduction of tests because it's not convenient to show the reality. Mm, that sounds like Trump, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a big issue because um, for, I mean, for starters, the government is not being transparent with the situation, you know, if we have such a severe situation in the country where we are, you know, close to reaching 60,000 deaths, we should be using our resources to increase the number of tests and to prevent more deaths, not to hide the deaths that are occurring. Mm, and what, what really is going to tell us in, in this, um, uh, this fact that, you know, that the number of deaths do not match the reported um, deaths by the government is that um, mortality rates are, are increasing in the country. So no, they're not matching with the, the number of deaths reported from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And well, tragic. Unfortunately, I didn't um, put up the, the, that graph here, but if we go to the next graph, are we there now? Yeah. Yes. So this, this is, is called the, the share of COVID-19 tests that are possible. Positive, yeah, here. So basically this was going, uh, you know, um, from my last point that, in, you know, we see, from July 23rd, that the number of positive cases has been increasing. So, you know, these two graphs um, do not make sense together, and this is being manipulated, you know, the, the information that's been shared by the government, and mm. the response, unfortunately, hasn't matched what we, the response that we need in terms of, you know, the number of cases. These, these uh, numbers are from the government then on these charts? This actually is data from our, wor uh, our world and data. So this um, chart is not from the government. This is from an independent um, uh, organization. But if we see the first slide is from the government. So if you want to go back to well, the- Let's go back to the first slide. That was, yeah, okay. That's official government data. Yeah. Oh, great concern, Emily. Um, it's um, it's a great concern everywhere. It's certainly a great concern in this country, but it, it's uh, it's somehow discouraging to find that Mexico is tracking the same path or a similar path that the U.S. is tracking. So, what what does this mean to you? I mean, to us uh, here in Hawaii, we we've had you know we we were able to suppress the curve for a while. Uh, I think people were serious about following the rules. They stopped, they got, you know, they got complacent and it went up and then, and then Trump started talking about uh, reopening and everybody got more complacent and businesses started opening group, groups and restaurants and what have you. And then it got really wild and it's been wild. Uh, we have had a serious uh, increase in the number of cases daily uh, in the past few weeks. It's, uh, not not happy time. So people like me, uh, we can work at home. We do work at home, and we don't go out much. Do you go out much? It's actually very similar than um, the approach that Mexico is taking. You know, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the handling of the opening of the economy and then shutting it down again and then opening again because of the you know increasing numbers of, um, of cases. So for example, uh, you know, and, and here in Mexico, I mean, I'm sure it also happens in the US where it, it varies um, from state to state. 
um, because you know here every um, from the local level um, governments are taking the measures that they consider appropriate appropriate um, and for example in the state of Yucatan they even have a ban in alcohol right now so actually they started with a ban in alcohol then they you know took the ban away and the number of cases increased. So now they've banned alcohol again. <laughs> and they're saving a curfew. Um, people are, um, are um, there's a mandate to wear masks in public. Um, so it, it's, it's been, uh, you know, very different um, in each state. And the, that example in Yucatan is one of the states with the, you know, strongest um, measures. And uh, so basically, I mean, what we're seeing is that people are being responsible, I guess. I mean, in staying home, most of most people, I would say, I mean, at least um, in, in my circle of friends, I know people are, you know, um, being careful and quarantining and everything. And personally, I, I am, um, and, you know, not leaving the house <laughs> much. <laughs> Although, you know, I mean, things also have to kind of, you know, um, you know, we, we have to be um, moving in a new direction in terms of a new normality, you know, a new normal. And, are, you, uh, are you wearing masks uh, when you go out? Yes, definitely. Um, I make sure to wear my mask when I'm in public spaces and public areas. Um, because, you know, I think it's being a responsible citizen. And it's not precisely that I fear that I'm going to get it, but, you know, who I can um, transmit it to if, you know, if I have it and I don't know it. <laughs> um, do you know anybody? Do you know anybody who has uh, become infected? I do. I, I knew, I know a couple of people um, who have gotten it and they've, you know, isolated and been, you know, self-quarantining in their homes for a couple of months until they got rid of it. And now they're just like, as normal, you know? Uh, so okay, I, good to hear that. Nobody died then, huh? No, I mean, the, the cases that I am aware of, of people um, close to me have been of younger age. So, you know, and they've been able to recover from it more easily. What about distancing? Um, is there, are there rules about distancing and are people following them? Well, yes. I mean, there is, you know, everywhere you go, you go um, people in, in, I mean, I've been to one restaurant since this, you know, started in March. So, and, and that restaurant was pretty much empty. So, I mean, that's why I felt safe to go and everything. And people were, you know, are, I, I believe like businesses are being very careful in, you know, in having all the necessary um, protections. And so that's a positive sign. Um, but in terms of, I mean, distancing, I think, I mean, in Mexico, Mexico is very family oriented and people, you know, love to, are very effective and love to be hugging even the president, you know, um, he goes on a, on a rally or whatever, and he's hugging people on the streets and everything. So it's part of our culture, you know, the close um, contact and stuff. Um, and that's definitely not good for a COVID, <laughs> but, and the, but um, I think people, you know, are starting, I mean, they, they, they get it, but it's also hard because it's, you know, we're so affectionate. <laughs> yeah. uh, too bad, you know, because at the end of the day, I mean, hugging is good for you. It's good for everybody who hugs wherever they are. It's a sign of, a, you know, affection and trust and so forth. And um, when we come out of this, I think there'll be a lot less hugging going on in the world. Yes. <laughs> That's really too bad. It's different how people are interacting nowadays. I mean, you don't even shake hands. It's just, a, it's going to change the world, I think. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, AMLO? Is he, um, is he strong about this? Is he, has he um, set down rules? Has he enforced rules about masks and social distancing and and reopening, um, uh, wh where is his head at? Is he is he effective in, in dealing with the COVID? Well, since the start of this pandemic, um, he's 
you know, he, he holds a, a daily um, conference. It's called the Mañanera, where he basically... What does that stand for, Emily? And, Mañanera? And there's not like a direct translation, but it's basically okay. like a morning press. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, so in his daily morning press, which lasts an hour, um, he, you know, touches on different topics and it's interesting to he listen to it because it's where he said he's, he sets his agenda in, in all areas, you know, it's just a very not so formal setting where he's just like saying um, his policy approaches and everything, you know, so in his mañanera, he basically has said that he does not believe in the effectiveness of wearing a mask. Oh, and, I'm sorry to hear that. And and you know, and he basically, I mean, goes in public without wearing the wearing the face mask. Um, so it's unfortunate because you know there's a lot of people watching the mañanera and you know learning from the example of the president so it's it's not um, ideal for the country's president to say that wearing a mask is stupid and also um the the health um caesar which is um uh, lopez gatel he which is you know has been the head of the of the epidemiology team in mexico um, since the beginning and and he also carries a daily um, you know press conference and he's even you know sent very confusing messages to the people on whether um, we should be wearing masks or not you know he said you know wearing mask is a complementary action but you know washing your hands is what's more effective i mean just like saying a lot of confusing messages where you know it's pretty obvious that you know the evidence is there already that should suggest that wearing a mask is what can help you know um, prevent the spread of the virus so it wouldn't hurt if you know the health caesar would just you know be more clear and in, in saying to the public that they should wear a mask <laughs> mm. you know, let, I, me, let me ask you a hypothetical question um you know though if i were a mexican person or living in mexico i would be mighty offended with the way the trump administration has treated my country on the other hand uh, it, it would appear that what trump does uh, casts a long shadow it casts a shadow on canada it casts a shadow on everything south of the border too because people listen to him including some dictators south of you and for example brazil um and i wonder if trump's uh, mi mixed messages his dog whistle confusion messages and the confusion of his administration uh, has some effect on uh, amlo and the way the mexican government works in other words my question to you is had trump been sending clear messages on these things don't you think that AMLO would have followed suit on that and we wouldn't have this confusion in Mexico? What do you think? That's a very good question. And I mean, I don't know the exact answer, but I think my reasoning is that actually Trump and AMLO share a lot of characteristics in terms of their governing style, um, where you know they're um, pretty much nationalistic in their approach and in interviews. And I think it, 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 it kind of, I mean, the populist approach in Latin America also, um, I think it's been undermining the response for COVID-19, mm -hmm. what an appropriate response should be. And this yeah. is because you know, they feel like they are, the best country in the world, if it's Mexico or if it's the U.S., um, and that they can, you know, um, do whatever they want, <laughs> yeah. and and that they're going to be well off. But I think you know it's important that they recognize the responsibility that they have for in their countries. You know, I mean, it might be popular um, to to say that wearing a mask is stupid among the public, you know, because it's 
it's not boring it's you know it's entertainment it's um you know i mean there's a lot of people who are unfortunately not well informed as to make you know wise decisions mm. so so this this brings me to a question about um about the skinheads and uh, those people who follow trump on on the level of bigotry uh, racism and so forth um, and, and and he has with them uh, weaponized the whole idea of a mask uh, he's, he's made it a political issue and if you don't wear a mask you're for him if you do wear a mask you're against him and that's really completely irrational but i am wondering whether you have the same phenomenon in mexico do you have people who refuse to wear masks because because of Trump or because they feel it's, it's their right not to wear a mask, it's a political issue for them? Do you have that? Actually, no. I mean, I think people are much more willing to wear masks here in Mexico. And I, I haven't really heard from Mexican people in terms of, you know, um, being threatened that there, someone is taking away their rights, you know, because of the wearing of the mask. So I don't see that um, that reaction from the Mexican public as much as you know we see it in the U.S. Um, I think people here, you know, because it's I guess it's it's a more family-oriented society than what you have in the U.S. That's a more individualistic society. I think that um, difference. Um, it, it, it explains why we have, you know, different reactions among the public. I think here people are more worried about, you know, passing it on to their relatives than what they might be in the U.S., you know. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's shift gears for a few minutes, Emily. Um, let's talk about the reopening and the economy. As you know, the U.S. is in, the economy is in the tank. And it looks like it's going to stay there for a while or get way worse. Not clear. Congress has been dysfunctional or non, non-functional in dealing with a social safety net. And I wonder how things are doing in Mexico. Have you uh, got a parallel process going on in the economy? So contrary to the U.S. approach where you have seen um, certain, as you know, a stimulus um, package being provided to to the people here in Mexico has pretty much been all men to themselves. I mean, in terms of, you know, everybody's on their own in here. <laughs> and there's really have, has not, there hasn't been any um, support from the government in providing, um, you know, aid and relief to to the people who are you know and who are going through a rough economic time and it's also i mean it's it's only going to get worse from here and um, the world bank has a projection for mexico's economy contracting um, by 7.5 percent this year mm. uh, so the economic impact is already being felt throughout the country and the, the, the government's response has been, you know, um, you know, unfortunate because um, we haven't seen any contracyclical measures or any, you know, type of um, economic support. And this is going to hurt, you know, small businesses and uh, Mexican society in general. We are going to... How about people? Can they eat? Uh, you know, do you have social unrest as a consequence? Well, um, so Mexico and the government has a very strong support from the Mexican public, as you may already know, and the government won by a majority. So his popularity is still very um, high. He holds about um, a 50% popularity. I haven't checked the numbers recently, but since the pandemic, they have gone down because his handling of the, of the pandemic has been so bad um, that his popularity has declined, but it's still very high. It's still about a 50% from a 67%, I believe, that when he started, uh, which was in 2019. So, so I take it that, you know, this is a decline in the economy and a gross... Uh, domestic product 
uh, and so forth um, has an effect on energy. We need to spend a little time, uh, you know, evaluating that. Uh, energy projects, uh, energy developments, energy investment. What effect on those things in Mexico? So in terms of um, the Mexican energy policy right now is going um, through a change. Um, we, the government is, is, has a very different idea in terms of what Mexico's energy sector um, direction should be. And it looks a lot more um, nationalist than what the previous administration um, had um, laid out. So we're seeing that Mexico is, and its government is really pushing um, to strengthen um, Mexico state-owned oil company, Pemex. Mm. And this is undermining private sector participation, which is, you know, it's also bad for the economy because it is, um, it's causing, you know, private sector investments to look elsewhere. So at the end of the day, uh, when we all come out of this, and I hope it's soon, um, Mexico will have lost possible investment in the private sector uh, energy economy. No? Yes, and this is because um, the government, like I said, is favoring Pemex and CFE, which are um, both um, state-owned energy companies. Um, mm -hmm. So this favoring undermines private sector participation. Mm, too bad. I only have one more question for you, Emily, and that is something I read in the in the paper. It was in all the Mexican papers this morning. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, AMLO has decided that he wants to uh, submit um, to phase three testing of the uh, Russian vaccine, which is, by the way, interestingly enough, called Sputnik Five. <laughs> <laughs> Sputnik 5, you know, referring to way back in the, I guess it was in the 50s, uh, when, when Russia, saw, you know, was the first one to send a, a, um, a satellite into orbit, and they're still, you know, celebrating that event and that success. <clears throat> so, the, you know, I guess they're referring back to, uh, to that to, to demonstrate that their, their, their COVID vaccine is early. Uh, you know, it's a great success for them. But what's interesting is that he has submitted himself. He said, you show me efficacy and I will personally participate in the phase three trial. And I will get a lot of Mexican people to participate in the phase three trial, even though there really hasn't been a lot of trials up to this point. And it, there's a certain amount of risk and the American medical community, research community is saying, what, are you kidding? <laughs> this is untried. So what do you think about that? What do people think about that in Mexico? Well, it's, I mean, it's very, interesting to see that he wants to be the first one to have that vaccine in Mexico. So let's see how that goes. At the same time, um, they're also um, developing a new uh, vaccine. Um, so Mexico and Argentina stroke a deal to come up with a vaccine here in Latin America. So hopefully that goes out well. Um, it's being funded by the Slim Foundation. So it's going to be um, oh, Car Carlos uh, Slim, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be free to the public, and I mean, hopefully, we can um, have it ready soon. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting, Emily, if uh, if Mexico and Argentina that that collaboration actually resulted in a working uh, vaccine, and then the U.S. would be asking. Uh, if Mexico could do it a favor and provide some of the vaccine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'll think you'll have to think long and hard about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what would you like to tell you know people in the U.S. about the Mexican experience and uh, what what Mexico has learned from it to the extent Mexico has learned and um, and how uh, the U.S. can think about it in context of the Mexican experience. So in dealing with COVID-19? Yes. So, so basically, I mean, I guess, I mean, what I would like to tell the U.S. is to be responsible and I mean to, I don't know, I mean, 
to provide um, the the resources and capabilities that the world needs right now. Mm, it definitely, I mean, all countries in the world are watching the U.S. and are following their example. And I think um, it's going to be interesting to see um, how they continue to respond to this issue and whether they continue to lead the world in the direction that needs to be led. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so well put. That's really a, a, a wonderful answer to my question, Emily. Uh, Emily Medina of, of EPRINC in Mexico City, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure. Aloha and vaya con Dios. Aloha. <laughs>